Okay, so today we're very happy to have Gabriel Wong from Fudan University. He's going to be telling us about entanglement entropy and edge modes and topological string theory. Uh, please go ahead, Gabriel. Uh, hi, so thank you for the invitation and thank you for making this special time for me to come into my time zone. Uh, this is a paper based on a recently posted, um, this is a talk based on a recently posted paper with William Donnelly, Nanki Kim, and Yikun Jiang. And there'll be a follow up coming up soon. So I want to motivate my talk by discussing first ADS CFT and the HRRT or generalized entropy formula, which is the basis for our understanding of how space time emerges from entanglement. Uh, the formula tells us that the entanglement entropy of a boundary CFT of some sub subregion V is given by uh, the generalized entropy in the bulk, which has an area term, uh, which is the analog of Bekensian honking entropy, plus a bulk correction, which is the uh, entropy of bulk quantum fields across this extremal surface gamma. We want to ask the question of what is the bulk microscopic interpretation of this area term? It's an interesting question because we think that it is giving us the entropy of the space time itself rather than some fields on top of it. And in particular, we want to understand this question from the point of view of the bulk string theory. Uh, our main inspiration for thinking about this problem comes from Suska and Oglum. Uh, they propose that Bekenstein Hawking entropy is the entanglement entropy of closed strings across the horizon. Uh, before reviewing Suskin and Oglum's Proposal, I want to discuss a bit about the factorization problem and edge modes. So understanding entanglement in the bulk is difficult because we have to first factorize the Hilbert space. And that problem is hard because factorization is sensitive to UV degrees of freedom. For example, Dan Harlow observed that if we take the ADS Schwarzschild geometry, it's obvious that the boundary factorizes. We have two uh, CFTs and we have tensor product of the one on the left and the right. However, if we consider um, a Wilson line in a low energy gauge theory in the bulk, it's not so obvious that this Wilson line factorizes. In fact, it does not factorize unless you have access to the bulk microstates, which we can treat as charges to put at the end point of these Wilson lines so that we can cut the total Wilson line into two parts. Another way to say the same thing is that the low energy theory has to be extended to include entanglement edge modes and these edge modes are related to the bulk uh, microstates. It's been conjectured that perhaps the area term in the generalized entropy is actually the entanglement entropy of these edge modes that's fusing together the space time across this horizon here. So let's see what Suskin and Ogham had to say about this. So they were doing a replica trick in perturbative closed string theory. So here log Z is the Euclidean path integral on a replica manifold, but in, in the string theory. And uh, the diagrams that contribute to the entropy either intersect the conical singularity or have to go around it. Um, so in particular, the contact term, the sphere diagram that intersects the conical singularity gives us the Bekenstein honking entropy. Uh, Suskin and Ogun's idea was to apply open closed string duality to give a canonical interpretation of this tree level term. Instead of thinking about it as a closed string that is emitted and absorbed, we should think about it as an open string that you swing around in a one loop fashion. So this open string is like half of the closed string that's been hidden behind the horizon or half that is not hidden behind the horizon. And uh, in this open string channel, there seems to be a trace and a canonical interpretation. So in this case, the string edge modes are some kind of brains that is cutting this uh, closed string into open strings. And notice that even though we're studying closed string perturbation theory, when we want to cut the string, we have to uh, introduce non-perturbative objects, which are these brains. It would be interesting if we could realize the Suska and Oglum idea in ADS, perhaps it would give us a string theory description of generalized entropy. Uh, so in, in some previous work, uh, well, Donnelly and I considered the uh, string theory dual to uh, two-dimensional Yang mills. Um, and we applied extended TQFT methods to uh, factorize the Hilbert space and compute uh, the entanglement entropy and found a realization of Suskin and Oglum's ideas. 
so here we're going to upgrade and apply extended TQFT methods to the A model topological string. Um, what's useful about this model is that it's perturbative amplitudes are computable to all orders in string coupling. Um, and uh, the string field theory itself is captured by topological field theory. That's crucial because um, the, we understand entanglement in, in a second quantized uh, sort of formalism better than in the first quantized one. And finally, this theory has a nice UV completion in terms of Q-deform diagnosis. Um, and I must apologize, there was a reference that was in order. There were previous studies uh, on the A-model topological string using uh, duality um, by uh, Raghumani and Rubini and, and Roger. Um, so let me summarize the work that we did. We studied entanglement entropy in topological string theory using Gopakuma Vafa duality. This is a topological analog of ADS CFT um, on the bulk. Uh, the the an analog of the bulk ADS is played by the closed strings on a usual conifold geometry. Uh, this is a geometry that looks like a pyramid over an S2 times S3 base. There's a radial direction along which uh, the S3 shrinks, but S2 remains of finite size. And uh, there are some B food flux going through this sphere. On the open string side, there is a deformed conifold geometry. Here, um, the S2 is shrinking instead, and the S3 remains of finite size, and there's a large N number of grains on that S3. So uh, what's useful about this duality is that we know the string field theory on both sides. In the closed string side, we have the A model TQFT, it's a topological quantum field theory. And on the uh, open string side, we have UN Chen Simon's theory. So we were able to apply this extended TQFT approach to factorize the closed string Hilbert space and give a canonical calculation of entanglement entropy on both sides of the duality. The edge modes, it turns out, are anions that transform under quantum group. And we realized the Susskind Uglum idea that closed string entanglement entropy is indeed the thermal entropy of open strings that are ending on some entanglement grains. Uh, I think one of the punchlines of my talk is that. Uh, I'll, I'll make the claim that the entanglement entropy we compute in the bulk is actually a topological string description of generalized entropy. So before I go on to dive into topological strings, I want to say something a bit more about generalized entropy and shrinkable boundary conditions. So the generalized entropy I mentioned earlier is obtained by doing the Euclidean path integral on a cigar geometry with a shrinking cycle. So this is the type of um, smooth geometry that we study where the, 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 the circle here, the boundary shrinks in, in the ball. Now, uh, the question is, you know, this is a prescription, we call it an entropy, but is it really an entropy? So to give it a canonical interpretation, we have to uh, view this Z of beta, which in this, in, in the Euclidean pattern goal, we're doing a semi-classical evaluation. So, we see, we're valving a path integral, but we have to interpret the path integral as a trace, even though there's no global circle. Naively, we could achieve this interpretation if we just cap, cut out the little cap here, and then put some boundary condition we call E, that I call a shrinkable boundary condition. Its job is to produce the same uh, path integral as if you put the cap back on. If we could do that, we would have something like a trace. However, this shrinkable boundary condition does not have to be local. And in, in fact, generally is non-local in the modular time variable, which is the time going around this circle here. So how do we interpret this? Uh, so one of the punchlines of my talk is that we were able to answer this question in, in topological string theory uh, by appealing to TQFT, uh, extended TQFT methods. And we will argue that the same framework applies to JT gravity. So I think this is a good point to pause for questions. And, and as you say that uh, it's, this talk might get a little bit technical at times and I think it will work best with uh, lots of questions. So let me pause here. Could you explain why uh, string theory is a topological quantum field theory? I usually think of those as uh, not the same axiomatic framework. It is not generally the same. It's 
um, somewhat of a miracle that in this case, the topological string theory can be, the, the string field theory, the second quantized theory in target space can be formulated as a TQFT. And in fact, this is not, uh, we're gonna look at a very particular class of target spaces for the A but model. The uh, topological quantum field theory would not sum over the target space uh, topology. Are you, uh, wouldn't you do that in string theory? Ah, so in the A model that we study, we don't, but so there's a completion of the A model. So it will turn out the A model is sort of like the chiral half of a conformal block. The, com the UV completion here that, um, that is called, is the large N limit of Q deform Young Mills is, has this uh, expansion where you sum over like many different blocks and each block um, is like has the chiral half of a, of a A model string multiplying the anti chiral half. So in that full UV completion, in fact, uh, some older papers of, uh, I'm gonna forget all the names up, but I think Oguri Vafa um, diagraph, they actually discussed um, um, baby universes and uh, summation over topology uh, changing um, backgrounds here. But, but because we are just selecting like really the vacuum block and the chiral half of vacuum block, we're not gonna have those uh, sums over backgrounds. We're gonna have a fixed background, which is the result conifer. What is the parameter that justifies keeping only one of them as opposed to summing? Why is that a good approximation to keep only one? Um, it is simply a consistent perturbative closed string theory. I'm not, uh, I mean, we, there's a perturbation series. Uh, we can write down uh, the amplitudes on an arbitrary target space and then we glue together the target spaces. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if I can, um, identify a parameter, but I can tell you, so well, I, I'll explain in this talk that I can literally give you um, a set of rules for gluing together the target space for this A model, this chiral A model theory. And it is completely consistent from the point of view that it satisfies all the rules of a TQFT. And then I'm going to extend it into, so the extension is to go beyond the normal TQFT to allow for cutting Cauchy sizes, but um, it satisfies all the axiomatic rules of topological quantum field theory. So I think in that sense, it's completely self-consistent. Uh, sorry, can I ask? Uh, are you actually claiming that you have a topological or close topological string field theory for the A model? Yeah, I mean, it's not my claim. I think it's just some work done, uh, which uh, I, I should maybe cite better, but there, there is a class of target spaces, which are, um, rank two bundles over uh, some Riemann surface, which uh, Vafa and uh, Salina, Vina Ganajic and Marino um, showed that if I look at the target space amplitudes of the A model string, these are the, right, uh, I can study how do these amplitudes get cut up or include, right? And the rules no, no, I, for the, cutting the, up- I, 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 I'm not asking that question. I'm asking whether you have a prescription for a closed string field theory in the I think so. Model. I mean, uh, well, I, I think that requires defining what a closed string field theory is. From my point of view, a closed string field theory is the target space. If, if I can tell you um, the all of the target space amplitudes, the, the multi-string amplitudes. So the crucial thing about the string field theory is that I call it a string field theory because I have the Hilbert space of the many string and I have the amplitudes for the multiple string states. So I can give you complete information about those. Uh, so it's just, in that sense, a second quantized um, Hilbert space of strings. Uh, so in, in the restricted class of, of target spaces that we're studying, it is a topological quantum field theory. Well, the confusion I think Clay and I have is that this doesn't, you, you need to say more, you need to say what exactly are the, what is the off-shell set of configurations you're summing over. It's not just the on-shell data of, of amplitudes. To give you a close string uh, field theory. Good, good, good. So, so even to talk about off shell and on shell, you're already talking about a path integral. But so I'll get to this. And so I, I have an outline here when I discuss the um, TQFT formalism. A TQFT formalism, from the point of view of like Atia and these mathematicians, does not involve the notion of path integration on a space of fields. It involves this categorical notion where you tell me the target space time. And if you, the idea is that path integral is just a rule that tells you what amplitude to assign to that 
space time. And the fact that it is possible in like normal strings, uh, normal field theory to path integrate over a space of fields that you call like off shell configurations, that's so, sort of not relevant in this way of thinking. You just tell me the answer, literally, what is the answer for the uh, um, linear map that's assigned to each space time, which I'll go into more detail later. And once you give me that, it has the same data as um, the path integral formalism in so far as it computes all the amplitudes you want, you want to. Uh, okay, I'll wait. Um, so maybe when we get to the TKFT section, let's, re if, if still, it's not, still not clear, we can revisit this because I think this is an uh, uh, important reason that I introduced this categorical notion of quantum field theory. It, it exactly this problem you're, you're bringing up. Like I wouldn't know how to do string field theory. And in general, I don't think many people do know how to do it. It's just in this very simple case, we have a categorical notion of the path integral. Okay, um, so let me, uh, if there are no more questions, let me do the outline of the top. Um, so I start by defining the state that, whose entropy we study. Um, it's the analog of the Hardo Hawking state in string theory. And then I'm going to formalize the, the factorization problem in the context of extended GQFT. And then I'm going to give you, uh, and this is the source of uh, many of these questions, I'm going to give you the A model closed TQFT and uh, our definition of generalized entropy. And then I'll um, explain the D brain edge modes and give the canonical calculation of the generalized entropy. If there is time, I'll uh, either talk about the relation to JT or the dual gauge theory computation, which I think both are important. Okay, so let me introduce the A-model topological string. So this is a string theory whose target space is a six-dimensional Taylor manifold. Uh, it does not have to be collateral. The closed string theory is simple because it localizes to world tree instantons that wrap uh, minimal volume two cycles. On the resolved quantum flow, the only such two cycle is the one at the tip. It's a sphere here, which we allow to have a complexified area. Uh, the real part is the area, the imaginary part is the flux. Um, so the amplitudes of the A model just only care about this Kalen modulus T. Um, now, uh, the free energy is an instanton sum. Uh, this little N here is labeling the winding number or the wrapping number of this genus G world sheet around this sphere at the tip. And so all the action in the string theory is happening basically at this sphere uh, at the tip. And we can remarkably get an exact answer for this free energy uh, where we actually summed over the genus G of the world sheet here. Uh, so this uh, gives us uh, a very uh, useful starting point for studying entanglement. We have an uh, exact answer for the conifold partition function. And now uh, before I define the state, I need to talk about time slices in string theory. It's not the same as in QFT. So in the first quantized string theory, a state is a wave functional of a closed loop. So here I have the closed loop parameterized by a world sheet spatial coordinate sigma, and x mu is the embedding function that maps the string into, into the target space. Uh, now, a wave function of this of one string is actually a function of the entire loop configuration. So that means that um, this is a function on loop space of x, not on space time. And for the same reason, when we second quantize the theory, the string field uh, should be obtained by promoting this wave function to an operator, just like we normally do. And that is again a function null, an operator valued function null of a loop configuration. So the degrees of freedom don't live on space time, they live on the loop space. And so a time slice will also be a subset of the loop space rather than the space time. However, the story I think is simplifies quite a bit for the topological string. Um, first, given a time slice of the space time like sigma here, which cuts through S2 at the tip, um, we can define f, curly f of sigma, a time slice of the loop space, by just saying that we only consider loops that live inside sigma completely. The whole string is inside sigma. It will make a further restriction that the string loops live inside a Lagrangian submanifold, curly L, which has this topology of a, of a non compact torus, it's C times S1. And we'll only consider the string loops that live, uh, that go along the non contractible cycle of this Lagrangian. So that's our time slice. And now we're gonna define a, a Hardo-Hawking state. So 
we start with the resolved quantum fold partition function whose exact answer we know. All right, and I, I got uh, confused. Why do you only consider strings that live inside that, su that Lagrangian subset? Um, it's a choice. So it's a consistent choice. Uh, I guess I'll show it to be consistent later, but it no, turns but if out I'm, that- if I'm considering the Hilbert space of a, uh, of a theory. I don't get to say I restrict the particle of time t to be only on the x-axis. That's not all the states. Uh, tr true, but you can think about it in two ways. Uh, one way to think about it is that I'm restricting to a subspace. So if I have a Hilbert space, uh, I have a subspace of states and everything is self-consistent, then um, th there's, there, there's a self-consistent way to talk about entanglement, for example, on factorization. The other way to think about it is that maybe we shouldn't say that we're restricting the loop space. We're just saying that the particular wave function we study, which is a hot or state, had zero amplitude on any loops that are not uh, going around the non-contractible cycle of S1. Is this because of supersymmetry in the context that you're talking about? Because um, the Lagrangian because subspace is a supersymmetric condition. Look, ah, so uh, it has to do with, it does indeed have to do with boundaries of the world sheet, but it has to do with the fact that, so here um, the, free energy is the instanton sum, right? And so we want to study these string instantons. And um, it turns out that basically we only care about the instantons that are non-trivial. That mean, means that they end on a loop that is uh, non-contractible and going around the S1. If you chose other loops that are shrinkable, right? There is indeed a contribution from those which are de called degenerate instantons that world sheets have to shrink to a point. Um, it turns out that those contributions to the topological string partition function are not well defined on a non-compact manifold like the resolved conifold anyways. So if we included those contributions, it would be ambiguous and we would have to fix it in some way, that other way anyway. So, so what, what we've done here basically is ignored the contributions from these so-called, um, I guess, degenerate instantons, the world, the, the, the world sheet that shrink to a point. And uh, the fact that we can consistently do it again is indicated by our actual calculation, right? We, we show that there's a consistent TQFT you can define, defines all the space of states of closed strings. We showed that we can prescribe a generalized entropy by a replica trick and also reproduce it using canonical calculation. So I think that I'm, I'm saying a bunch of words to make you feel comfortable here, but ultimately it's our calculation that justifies it a, a posteriori. Well, I'm just trying to understand if the reason the truncation is justified is because the topological string is twisted. It throws away lots of information about string theory, right? It's a, it's a cohomological theory, right? It doesn't know everything about strings on these geometries. It just knows about some supersymmetric set of information. That's certainly part of it. I mean, that's why, uh, I mean, the, the fact that what I said, that the free energy becomes an instant on sum is a consequence of what you just said, right? So. I think that's that's a part of it, but I'm saying even with that simplification, there are some degenerate instantons that we are we are throwing away, but we're consistently throwing it away. That, that's all I'm saying. Sorry, I I, I I'm very confused. A partition sum is not an index. Supersymmetry plays no role. You cannot talk about entanglement by restricting to a subspace or the Hilbert space because you have no a priori idea whether your whether your states are entangled across that subspace. So unless you have the full Hilbert space, there is no sense and a factorization, there is no sense of talking about entanglement. And so super uh, symmetry- So I, I, I'm talking sorry. about the kind of thing where like you could have like in your, um, th there is sort of like a vac, I think people call it the extreme entropy that there's sometimes that there's a constant term in your entanglement entropy that you could, just kind of subtract, right? Like if you had, um, you know, if, if you tensor your density matrix with some uh, identity matrix of some dimension, right? You're gonna get some, there, there's some, I, I would say there's, it, there's a possibility of an ambiguity of a constant in your entanglement entropy. And I think that that would be the kind of thing we're throwing away. I, no, I, I agree that I if you know that you have a tensor factor that is unentangled, then what you're saying is true. However, if you have a subspace or Hilbert space, then you don't know what the tensor factorization is. Therefore, you cannot argue 
that you can ignore the complement subspace. Right, but I, again, I think um, the answer again is it's not just an argument. I'm doing a calculation that's self-consistent, right? So I'm giving like, so I think this will become clear if I get to the part about topological quantum field theory because I'm giving you a set of states for the, that defines the closure in Hilbert space. And I'm telling you exactly what is the topological quantum field theory that describes all amplitudes for associated with transitions between these states. And I'm telling you a consistent way of cutting those amplitudes in a way that is consistent with factorization and entanglement. So I, I'm doing a bunch of calculations to see that, I think there's no question this is a self-consistent uh, calculation. Um, I think none of us are doubting that uh, your calculations will be self consistent what we're confused about is the interpretation i think it's it, it just seems true that you don't have access to the entire string hilbert space so it seems hard to to argue that you'll be able to uh reproduce the full entanglement entropy yeah no i agree so let's come back to i would say the following it it, it, it very well could be just my lack of expertise in this area that i'm not able to say precisely in in, in a precise enough way what is being missed here um, because I think that uh, there, I think it really is just a tentative product. There is a part of the partition function. So we, I wrote this partition function here. There's a part for the resolved counterfold that just comes from these shrinkable world sheets. And it is really just a, it is just multiplying Z by another factor, but that factor can be divergent. And like in these papers of Rafa and Salina, they fix it using some other ways. There's just some ambiguous thing. And I really think it just decouples, but um, I, I'm happy to leave it as a open question for the purpose of just getting through the, the part that I think will make you happy that, that everything is consistent. And um, uh, we can maybe in the discussion session, maybe discuss this more in detail, but I, I think that, yeah, I, I think that really just decouples that there's just an extra term that you multiply Z by. So if it's okay, let, let, let's continue a bit. I think that I think that the uh, the actual calculation will will be uh, comforting to uh, any of these concerns. So uh, let let me just uh, get back to defining the huddle hawking states, uh, starting with the resolved quantum field partition function. Uh, so the idea is that we want to cut the partition function in half in some sense. So how do we do that? It turns out the partition function is obtained by gluing topological vertices. So these vertices are open string amplitudes with a large n number of brains or anti-brains on this Lagrangian that I mentioned. And this Lagrangian cuts through the sphere along the equator. And if we put the brains on the Lagrangian and let the world sheets wrap the upper half of the hemisphere, we call the amplitude Z plus. Uh, Z minus is the name for the amplitude with anti-brains on the Lagrangian and world sheets on the lower half. And now when we annihilate the brain anti-brain pairs, we get a uh, we get back the world sheets that wrap the whole sphere. So this is very much like the QFT construction of the huddle hawking state. Z plus of U is playing the role of the huddle hawking state associated with uh, Z, the resolved counterflow partition function. A little more detail. So U here is the holonomy of the world volume gauge field on the brains wrapping L. And uh, notice that it is the gauge field in space time pulled back onto the boundary of the world sheet which I call S1 here via the embedding map. And so when we compute the, so the, what we call the huddle hawking wave functional is just this Z plus of U, we get it from the topological vertex expression uh, written in these papers. The precise numerical uh, coefficients don't matter. What matters is this trace U to the N factor uh, that comes from the coupling of the boundary of the world sheet to the holonomy of the gauge field. It is indeed a wave functional of loops because if I pull back this U onto the world sheet, it is a function of S on, on S1. So it's a function of, of loops as we had discussed earlier. Um, and in fact, this little end here tells you how many times the loop winds around the circle. And the basis of states that uh, we'll call the winding basis for, for this closed ring Hilbert space are given by these multi-trace factors in the large N limit. Uh, so we identify the closed ring Hilbert space with the class functions on U infinity. Uh, so now I'm going to, so 
uh, I've, I've proposed the Hilbert space, but now I'm going to describe the factorization problem in the TQ2 formalism to show the kind of self consistency of, of this definition. So normally we could define local factorization by using a space time Euclidean path integral. What we do is we do an evolution that changes the topology of the Cauchy slice. We start with a circle and we evolve it into an interval. Or we start with an interval and split into two intervals and etc. However, as um, uh, it was mentioned earlier in, in topological string theory, um, we don't have a space time path integral. And the idea of trying to do string theory and access all off shell con uh, configurations is intimidating. What we do instead is use a categorical reformulation of the path integral as a cobordism theory. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, a cobordism description is not a description of a path integral in terms of path integration over local fields. It is a generators and relations approach. Um, so let's be more specific. A cobordism theory is, is forms a category. So in two dimensions, this category has objects which are circles, uh, co-dimension one manifolds. And then there are gen the generators are the cobordisms, which are uh, manifolds that interpolate between initial and final circles. And then the gluing of these cobordisms have to satisfy sewing relations. A 2D closed DQFT is just a rule that assigns a Hilbert space, which I call the closing Hilbert space to circles. It assigns linear maps to cobordisms and the composition of the linear maps have to satisfy the same sewing relations as the cobordisms. Um, the particular structure of a 2D TQFT, 2D TQFT is the Frobenius algebra, where the multiplication of states is given by the pair of pants diagram here. Notice that these are cobordisms in space time. There are cobordisms in the target space uh, that's appropriate to the string field theory. Um, to describe entanglement and factorization, we have to cut open that, those co-dimensional slices. This is what uh, we call these. Why, why are we discussing a 2D TQFT? Why aren't we discussing a dimension of TQFT that's appropriate to the target space, which was like- uh, We will because, uh, because the beauty of this whole story is that I wouldn't know what to do with the six dimensional TQFT, but the beauty of this is we're gonna say in a moment that the A model on a certain type of fiber bundle, which is rank two vector bundle, is given by such two cobordisms, except I label, I add some labels to describe the fiber bundle structure. So I'll end up drawing exactly the same pictures as in two dimensions, except that I have to add, uh, I have to decorate the cobordisms with two numbers. And those two numbers are complete enough to specify the entire 6D ge geometry that we're interested in. And, and this is a very important miracle here. Otherwise, uh, you know, it, it will be very difficult to solve this problem. Um, so uh, where was that? Yes, so now we cut open the, the circle and now we see uh, we have an interval with endpoints. The endpoints have a label E that is labeling the edge mode. And now we have new cobordisms that go between intervals and also ones that go between circles and intervals. Uh, our way of thinking about factorization is that factorization map is just some elements of these cobordism data. So it's this guy here and this guy here. They are subject to local constraints that are given by the sewing relations of these cobordisms. So this open, H open is what we call the open string Hilbert space on this interval. And uh, the string theory will assign this Hilbert space to the interval. It also has some notion of trace and adjoint that's very important. The cobordisms that give us the trace and adjoint are these half annuli that we get from Googling the basic data. They are in, it, it corresponds to an invertible bilinear form. So it's invertible by this relation, the zigzag relation tells you you can straighten this and you get back the strip, which is the identity in TQFT. Our theory is not purely TQFT, it depends on area. So um, it becomes this propagator rather than uh, just a strip. But moreover, if I glue together these half annuli in a different way, if I make an annulus out of it, it defines a trace. And this trace is totally crucial to what we're gonna do here. Finally, uh, before, so we've discussed the sewing relations, but there's an extra axiom that uh, Will Dunlatley and I introduced called the e-brain. It says that factorization should not change the state. So if I split the circle into an interval and fuse it back, or I'll do the same to the interval and fuse it back, nothing, I shouldn't have changed my state at all. That means that I should be able to close up these holes that was created by the entanglement boundary. 
So our e-brain axiom is just an axiomatization of this shrinkable boundary condition. On the left here, we have uh, the exact form of the e-brain condition. It tells you I can close up this hole and make a cap. It is strong enough when you combine it with the rest of the sewing relations that all holes can be closed, including this one, which is saying that a sphere is equal to an annulus. This is a reformulation of Susskind and Oglum's open closure duality, but in the target space. And our whole framework for, uh, for what problem is we're trying to solve is we given the, we're given the e-brain axiom and the sewing relations. This is a complete set of constraints. And the idea is you just solve these constraints to get the factorization maps and edge modes by a bootstrap kind of method. Sorry, if I, can I expand this E uh, boundary condition in local operators? And if so, what do I get? Right, um, it's, some, it's some state on a disk basically. So why can't I just expand it in the local operators? Well, it depends on what you mean by local operators here. So it'll end up being a deep, so, so the best way to describe this boundary condition in, in, in this work is end up being saying that holonomy around this hole is non-trivial. The holonomy is not one. Holonomy of what? Sorry? The holonomy of what? Um, it, it will be, so, so it's the holonomy essentially of the road volume gauge field. Um, and uh, in the, there, there is, uh, I mean, I didn't introduce this basis, but in the Hilbert space, I showed you a winding basis. There's also a basis called the group basis. It's labeled by elements of the U infinity group or what will become Q deform U infinity. And the holonomy are the holonomy in this value in this, in this group. Uh, but, in, but, but the more physical interpretation is there is some holonomy of the world volume gauge field that this uh, group element represents. And um, what, what, what I'm trying to get at is that, that there, it will emerge once, uh, if I get far enough, that there's some very close relation between these pictures and JT gravity. And the non-trivial boundary condition there, again, uh, I, I mentioned that because there it was described in terms of the defect operator, right? You, you punch a defect operator there. And, and I don't think a defect operator is, a, I'm not sure if you call it local, uh, but, but we certainly have something similar. And um, uh, I think it's hard for me to answer this question completely at this point, but, but it, uh, the, the most precise answer is that we're basically gonna put some operator here that will correspond to putting a Calabial cap there. We're gonna fill this hole with a Calabial cap. A Calabial condition is some non-local condition. So, it, so I'm not sure that I can call it local operator. I, the best I can say is I can tell you what is the boundary condition around the hole and what is the object we're filling? I can give you the boundary states, put it that way. I can give you, if you think about deep brain boundary states, um, I don't know to what extent a deep brain boundary state is a local operator, but, but it's certainly a precise statement of the state you put in the hole, right? Maybe you should keep going so that I can see how, the, how this 2D stuff is related to the space time stuff, which I still don't understand. Good, 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 good. So let me keep going. Uh, if there are no other questions. Um, let me check on time. Okay. Um, so let me say what the A model TQFT is. It's uh, considering, we consider string theory on not a general target space, but a sum of line bundles over Riemann surface. So um, it turns out remarkably that the sewing rules for the multi-string amplitudes on this kind of target space are exactly the same as those of a closed GQFT. Now the cobaltisms are again drawn like this, like a 2D base manifold S, but now we have churn classes K1, K2 that, um, that capture the high dimensional geometry. So this picture is a six dimensional target space. And for example, the resolved corner fold that we discussed earlier, is just a sphere with these labels. And now all the sewing relations have churn class labels like the e brain. And another new twist is there's a Q deformation of the edge mode. So this annulus is now some kind of quantum trace and that will be important later. Okay, good. So, uh, sorry, I think that was supposed to be an outline. Uh, we're gonna talk about a model close to QFT, but now we're gonna talk about generalized entropy. Okay. Uh, so uh, before getting to that, I have to do one more restriction. So the A model TQFT, we've considered it now on vector bundles over a Riemann surface, but now I'm gonna impose Calabial condition. I'm gonna say that um, the Calabial condition is equivalent to saying the sum of the um, trend classes is minus 
the other characteristic of the base manifold. If I do impose this condition, it restricts to a subcategory of two-dimensional cobalisms uh, with these line bundles, such that they're generated by just these four guys. And this again forms a Frobenius algebra. And now, uh, even though these look like TQFT optics, we have to remember that it's really string theory. So when we glue them together, we're doing the same thing we did in the Hardo Hawking state. We put a large n number of brains and antibrains on the, um, uh, these slices represented by the circles, and we glue them together by brain and antibrain inhalation. Um, the answer we get, according to Aganajic and Guri and Salim and Vafa, is a general partition function on a Calabiao of this form. Uh, has a sum over representation labels of u infinity, has a degeneracy factor that's cute, that corresponds to a QD form symmetric group dimension. There is a phase, Q is e to the IG string. There's a phase whose exponent gives us the bundle structure. And there's a boson factor with an area T and L of R being the number of boxes in the Young table for R. Okay, so that, that's the A model DQ of T. Um, good, so now uh, we can define the generalized entropy. Uh, we start with the A model resolved conifold um, partition function. It has an explicit form like this. And now we just forget about factorization, just do a target space replica trick like septum ovum. Just give me a co-dimension one slice like this sigma here. It cuts through the sphere along the equator. We cut the equator into two halves, A and B. What this really means is we're cutting the sigma into two parts, but it projects down to uh, a and B. And we just do a normal replica trick. We let this angle around uh, the entangling surface to be two pi beta. However, we impose a very important condition. We have to impose when we replicate, there's an on shell condition. The bundle structure has to be the same, and the which means the Calabial condition remains satisfied. When you replicate a sphere, uh, a bundle over a sphere in this way, you just make a bigger sphere. Topologically, we still a sphere, and then the Kähler modulus increases by beta, and therefore the replicated manifold, uh, the partition function on it is simple. It's just like the one before you replicated, but you multiply t by beta. This is just a prescription, but if we follow the prescription, um, this gives us an entropy, which we think of as generalized entropy, that's very much the same as the entanglement entropy of a abelian, a non-abelian gauge theory. There is a probability factor P of R. And the R seems to be labeling some kind of edge symmetry uh, representations. And there seems to be a degeneracy factor DQR. This term, 2 log DQR, is what I would call the area term, the factor of 2 being coming from cutting the closed string twice here. OK, so that was the, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Can, I, can I check what exactly is your time slice again? Um, so uh, it's the, the one is this circle here. So um, in the resolved counterfold, um, so there is a sigma that is some uh, is the co-dimension one slice that's projected onto the equator of the sphere. But in, in particular, your time evolution is the angle around the sphere. Is the time cycle is contractible. Uh, sorry, could you say again? So the, the, this is mod, so when you say about time evolution, you mean the modular time here? You mean? No, I mean you you you're defining a Cauchy slice in the in this effective Cauchy slice in the space time, right? In the target space. So I'm just trying to understand what what the geometry of the Cauchy slice is. Ah, so um, I didn't put an equation for this Cauchy slice sigma. However, I know that I have a sphere. I have a bundle over a sphere, right? And then I can look at the equator of that sphere and I ask, what is the part of the whole bundle that when I do the projection that defines the bundle, it will project this sigma onto C. So, so that's, a, I mean, I, I think um, maybe this sounds like a roundabout way of doing this, but I, I, I'm sort of lifting C onto the whole bundle and the lift of C gives me the, the time slice. Um, and in terms of pictures here, I mean, a cartoon of it is like this, this slice here that cuts through the sphere. Okay, thanks. 
Good. So, uh, okay, that's 10 minutes maybe. Uh, it's 10 minutes? Okay, I'll try to stop now. Uh, what's the time limit here? I think 10 minutes is fine. It's fine, sorry? Yeah, you, you can keep going. There's been a lot of questions. Okay, okay, good, good. So now I want to explain the deep brain edge modes and the canonical calculation of this thing I call the generalized entropy. Um, so let me review the whole setup. So we have uh, a state that is defined by this cap, cobaltism, um, and we have an explicit expression for it. Um, and now we want to solve for the factorization map uh, subject to TQFD slowing relations and the e-brain boundary condition, or e-brain axiom, sorry. Uh, the factorization map is this cobaltism here. Um, it looks like we're taking a circle and splitting it twice. These are really A and B are really subregions, right? And the circle really represents um, you know, a higher dimensional object. And what this map represents is a map from the closed string Hilbert space to the tensor product of open string Hilbert spaces. And now we have, uh, in addition to the sewing relations, this E-brain um, condition, except that it's important that the cap on the left-hand side here is a Calabial cap. It has this precise turn class labeling. It turns out if you solve the sewing relations with this E-brain condition, you find that the edge mode symmetry group is not U infinity. It is a Q deformed version of the large N limit of UN. So I'm going to call it U infinity Q. And again, Q is related to the G string in this way. What this tells you is that the open string edge modes are anions because U and Q is the symmetry group of anions. Uh, and let me say what explicitly what those edge modes are. So when we we have this closed string loop around the equator here, which really lives inside this Lagrangian. To cut it into open strings, you have to introduce a large n number of entanglement brains on this L prime, this other Lagrangian, that intersects this, this Lagrangian here, this non compact torus, intersects it along these sort of what I drew as disks. And the intersection of these D brains is cutting this closed string loop. So I have a part in this blue in the A region and part that's red in the B region. And they have associated Wilson lines, uh, which are Q deformed Wilson lines valued in the quantum group. And now I can define a factorization map as follows. In the closed string uh, Hilbert space, uh, we have wave functions that are like trace of U uh, in some representation. Okay. However, I'm gonna promote that trace into a quantum trace. I'm gonna define a new notion of trace which I'll explain more later. And when I do, after I do that, I'm going to split the Wilson loop into two Wilson lines, which are these two guys here. And now I'm just going to write that trace that out explicitly. And it gives me this expression. There is R of IK. This is a representation matrix uh, for, uh, say, U infinity Q. And it is viewed as a wave function uh, inside the subregion. Similarly for this guy here. Uh, so these two guys are IK, RK, J wave functions. And the coefficients here is what I call the Drenfeld element. It is part of the definition of the quantum trace. So I haven't explained anything here. I'm just telling you what the factorization map is. And then I'm going to go on to explain uh, what these objects are. But uh, if, let me pause for a moment. Are there any questions so far? I mean, this may be a busy slide here. Okay, so let me let me say more about these UIJ. So I, I basically told you that this Wilson line at Q deform, but I didn't say what that means, right? So I want to explain what it means to Q deform. So um, let's say Q equals to one. Let's take the case of zero string coupling. There exists a commutative algebra of functions on UN. It's generated by these guys, which I call open string wave functions. So they're labeled by these Champatin factors I and J. And they're just a product of matrix elements of U, UN. The Champactin factors are the labels for the entanglement brains. So they're labeling these endpoints here of these open strings. And again, uh, I'll repeat what I said earlier. Uh, the reason these are wave functions is that the U should be pulled back onto the string well tree. So that it's a function no of string uh, open strings. And these obviously have bosonic statistics because we can multiply matrix elements however we want to. What it means to Q deform is to give these open strings anionic statistics. 
there exists a non-commutative algebra of functions on u and q. Uh, it is defined by the R matrix, which I didn't explicitly say, but it tells you that when you multiply the matrix elements themselves, that is not commutative. And that algebra, that equivalence relation where you mod out by the statistics is what I define to be the open string Hilbert space. Okay, so that may be sort of a weird object, uh, but now we're going to define what uh, is the Drenfeld element of this quantum group. So this quantum group, G, uh, an element of the quantum group G acts on the open string by the QD form version of conjugation. This is what I'm calling the edge mode symmetry. It's a natural generalization of the action of UN on itself. And the invariant trace function is given by the quantum trace. What is this quantum trace? It is the ordinary trace in some representation R but with an insertion of an operator, little u. This u I've given explicitly in the un case as a diagonal matrix with some phases, um, but really it's an object defined entirely by quantum group data. And the purpose of this object is so that when you trace identity, you get the quantum dimension of un. What is a quantum dimension? So it is a dimension of a collective Hilbert space of many anions. In this case, the anions are the open string edge modes, open string endpoints. Uh, what does that mean to have a collective Hilbert space? The idea is that if you take a large number of anions of type R, the collective Hilbert space grows in dimension like dim QR to the power N. So this is its notion, this more generalized notion of dimension of a Hilbert space. Um, so the Drenfeld element that defines our quantum trace in the string theory is a large n limit of this little u. This is actually quite subtle. It requires analytic continuation of q. Um, and it's quite magical. So first, what we do is we just multiply u by this factor of q to some exponent that just takes away the large n dependence that's explicitly in u. So there was this q to the n over 2 factor here. We just, we just delete that by multiplying by this factor. But we haven't removed all the n dependence because this is a large n by n matrix. And in particular, when we take the trace in an arbitrary representation of D, we have to regularize. Once we do that, uh, we get a miracle. Uh, we summed in this trace over UN indices, capital N. The answer gave us a dimension of symmetric group, which is Q deformed. Uh, it includes a phase that is important in giving us high dimensional uh, information about our A model QQFT. So this is some Q deformed version of the Schur-Val duality that, that relates U and Q to the symmetric group. Um, this is a very important uh, formula because it is the same kind of limit that is used to actually uh, basically relate the closed string theory to the open string theory in Gopakumavava duality. Because there again, there's a large N number of D brains and then when you go to the, other, the closed string side, this number n disappears. There's no dependence on n, it becomes flux, right? So uh, there is some, I think, deep relation there. Uh, but the intuition behind what this D is, is that it's the holonomy that defines the stringable boundary condition when we impose this calabial cap e brain condition. So this was, so I'm not sure if this answers your question. Uh, so earlier you asked me this, what, what happened is that we again have this entanglement hole that we created by splitting our state and now we have to impose a condition. What do we fill that hole in with? Because we impose the Calabial condition, uh, it turns out that the boundary state for that Calabial cap corresponds to having a non-trivial holonomy U around this uh, hole. And that U is exactly the Drenfeld element. Um, so that's really the, uh, the meaning of the Drenfeld element. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to do the, the calculation of entanglement entropy, but before I do that, let me also pause just for a moment. I, I think I'm going kind of quite fast. Um, are there any questions so far? Okay, so let me go to the punchline. So once we know these cobaltisms, we can literally do the entanglement cal calculation, uh, entropy calculation with its pictures. So I start with the hollow housing states, which is this cap, and I use the factorization map to split it into region A and B. Um, using the topological storing relations, I can pull up this kind of zipper here. It gives me, in the end, this half annulus, where I've labeled this Wilson line here that gives me some, uh, this D, D, D inverse is just saying that in the cobaltisms, um, 
Cobalisms are linear maps, and there's some insertion of this D operator whose index structure suggests that it's got a, is moving along this kind of upper boundary here. Uh, if the D is confusing, ignore it for now. It's not totally essential yet. Um, but now I'm going to define the density matrix. I just do it in a normal way. I take the ket and the bra, but I factorize it in a similar way as before using these cobalisms. And now I reduce the density matrix. I do a partial trace. Uh, the crucial thing is I must use the partial trace defined by the cobaltism theory, which are these half annuli, right? This half annuli takes an input and turn it into an output. And therefore it can glue together an input and output, which is what a trace is. And magically it does it so that everything all makes sense. So when you glue it in this way, the partial trace straightens out this diagram into a strip. And that strip is, um, is this propagator here that is degenerate for fixed R as it should be because the reduced density matrix is indeed, uh, it commutes with the edge mode symmetry and should be constant uh, for fixed R, labeling an edge mode um, irrep. The susken oglum proposal in this context is the following. I again take the quantum trace of this density matrix, which is the trace that's invariant under our edge mode symmetry. And uh, what's nice is now we glue together these guys to an annulus you don't get a strip, you get basically something where the Ds don't cancel and you get a factor of D inside and a factor of D inverse outside. What that does is that it gives you the entanglement boundary condition that allows you to close up the holes. And so we, we cover the sphere um, diagram, which is indeed the resolved conifold partition function. So what this equality says is that by summing over uh, open string Hilbert space, which is uh, labeled by brains, we get a closed string amplitude, a closed string diagram. And that's precisely the nature of a large N open closed string duality. Now we can compute the entanglement entropy just, just by taking, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I, I just, I get a little confused calling the Suskin Uglum, I mean, not, not to get into semantics, but just, you know, the whole point about the sphere diagram being important was that those diagrams we were thinking about were world sheet diagrams and the sphere diagram will give you a one over G string squared. And that's sort of why we're interested in it. And even if it's sort of hard to define on shell, et cetera. But these are all target space, second quantized string field theory calculations you're doing. Or... Right, it's a, that's why it's a generalization. It includes those sphere diagrams, right? It includes all diagrams. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. This doesn't map it all into just a single world sheet diagram. So if you prefer, I could not call it Suskin Uglum. It's just the thing I put no, on there. I was just trying to understand why you call it that. Okay, great. But yeah, it's not, it, it's not accurate. It's just a misnomer. Let me, yeah, so I totally agree. Um, uh, but the, the, the punchline here is that now we just define again, the trace row log row for entanglement entropy. But again, we, we always have to use the quantum trace. We basically have no choice. Like what I want to emphasize is that everything here is imposed by self-consistency, we're only allowed to use the operations that, um, we're only supposed to use the operations that the cobaltisms give us. And so this trace really, if you write it in terms of the regular trace involves an insertion of this D, this identifier element. And it recovers for you the generalized entropy that we defined earlier, right? Except that we've done it in a canonical calculation. We had a Hilbert space, we factorized, we did a trace. What's interesting is that this formula, while it may look unfamiliar uh, to some uh, to normal high energy person might find this unfamiliar, um, is familiar in two contexts. One is in non-unitary systems. Um, there are certain Q um, quantum group spin chains that describe non-hermitian physics where this is exactly the Q deform entropy that they use to measure the entanglement in this Q deform topological phase. Um, the other place where you may have seen this formula before is in the generalized entropy for JT. Uh, Jeffress, Koshmeyer, and Kataev Su both wrote down an equation very similar to this, where they said that um, the, uh, the, basically the entanglement entropy of the Hoddle Hawking state, um, uh, it, which is like a disk, you know, the, the Hoddle Hawking state uh, is um, defined by it norm being a disk. If you want to interpret that as a trace, you have to insert this D operator. So it is in this sense that we're producing, we're producing the generalized entropy um, using the topological string. And we're interpreting this D rather than as a defect operator 
we're interpreting in, in terms of symmetry of, uh, of the quantum group. Um, so let me, uh, so I have, I have a few more slides, but I think I, I'm, I feel, even though you said I can have more time, it, could you give me like, like a deadline, like, a, like how many more minutes should I go before I really stop? Because otherwise I feel I would be dragging people along. Well, we started five minutes late and there was maybe five minutes of questioning. So if you like, you can take five more minutes and then we'll stop. And okay, great, great, great. So let me say one more slide about this. Uh, so, um, oh, you know what? I, I think I'm going to skip this part because I think I want to give uh, another confirmation that this QD form entropy is not as funky as you might think it is, which is a dual gauge theory computation. So remember this theory had a large N gauge theory dual. So uh, we were discussing this whole time the resolved conifold. Um, there we, we described basically a state defined by having a, a set of probe brains where uh, world cheese can end and you define a hard hopping state. But we can uh, map this to the open string side. On the deformed conifold, what happened was that uh, this n, this n that was shrinkable, you know, th this, this end of the world sheet now is opened up and it's ending on the S3, wh which contains a large n number of brains. Um, and now uh, the, the open string theory on the deformed quantum fold has also a target space description in terms of UN Chern Simons theory. In the UN Chern Simons theory, um, this part, this uh, loop that the world sheet ends on is a Wilson loop. It is a Wilson loop inside a torus. And so we find that there is a dual huddle hawking state in the Chern Simons theory, which is a large n limit of the state. Each ket r corresponds to a Wilson loop inserted in a Chern Simons torus. And these are some coefficients in expansion of a state on the torus. Um, so what's interesting is that now, once we have the Chern Simons, Chern -Simons state, we can do the normal sort of uh, factorization that we know from Chern Simons theory. We basically cut these Wilson loops using WGW edge modes, uh, CFD edge modes that occur when you cut Chern Simons theory. And we use the undeformed regular, you know, uh, entanglement entropy, except that we delete, we, we uh, subtract the vacuum contribution. So this is what's referred to the defect entropy because it just gives the entropy of the Wilson loop. And we find an exact match with a closed string calculation. Notice that in this superposition, T is not a geometrical parameter in Transcendence theory. There is an exponential factor here. T is just um, some part of the probability uh, amplitude of this wave function. Um, but in the large n limit on the, on the closed string side, um, sort of by superposing these particular states in a particular way, there is an emergent closed string background that has a geometric modulus, which is equal to T. Uh, and finally, I should say that this setup here is very analogous to ADS-CFT. So this picture here, I've almost reproduced the same way in ADS-CFT where um, a uh, Wilson loop in, in this boundary CFT is indeed dual to um, a, a probe string worksheet if, if the Wilson loop is in fundamental representation. Um, now, a single Wilson loop would give you um, uh, corresponds to the probe string, which has an order one over G string entropy. Uh, but we know that space time entropy, sorry, I should say it's log of one over G string, right? Uh, because the disk diagram is one over G string, it gives you the uh, partition function and then the entropy goes like log of it. Okay, and, and in fact, the precise formula for the entropy above the vacuum, right, is given here. And in this case, for transcendence three, this modular Hamiltonian can be taken to be zero. So I have log of a Wilson, line, Wilson loop WR. Uh, what I want to say is that we recovered the space-time entropy scaling of one over G string squared when we cut a large number of Wilson loops. So if we put one Wilson loop in here, it wouldn't work. But in this previous slide here, there was a large number. Okay, so um, I think I should probably, uh, I think it's my five minutes up. If so, I will stop here. Well, thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, so I'll stop the recording here. We'll maybe take a five minute breather and then we can come back for discussions. <laughs>